With visions of Genghis Khan and his mounted warriors galloping across the steppe, we were headed to Mongolia. It would be a month-long journey of epic proportions, with enough memories to last a lifetime. Welcome to Mongolia, the country of endless blue skies. I just arrived in the capital city of Ulaanbaatar, and I'm getting ready for a month of adventures here in Mongolia. We were mesmerized by the spectacular chaos of the capital. The architecture is impressive in its diversity with temples scattered between old communist-era buildings, ultra-modern skyscrapers, and an seemingly endless amount of karaoke hangouts and dive bars. As winter approaches, the cityscape sadly changes for the worse. Ulaanbaatar has now become the third most polluted city in the world, mainly caused by coal pollution from the many gear districts. The locals burn coal to heat their homes as temperatures plummet and the fumes settle in the valley with nowhere to escape. The government is battling this grave issue, but at this point to no avail. Ulaanbaatar has one of the largest outdoor markets in all of Asia. It's called the black market, but it sells all sorts of things, not necessarily illegal things. Hopefully we can find some cool souvenirs and it should be pretty exciting. Let's go check it out. The history of UB is quite remarkable, and certainly unique. In true nomadic fashion, the capital of Mongolia originated as a large gear camp and changed its location at least 25 times before settling at its current location in 1778. Today UB is a sprawling metropolis, home to around 1.4 million people a staggering number representing roughly half of the country's entire population. This really puts the vastness and the remoteness of Mongolia into perspective, being one of the least densely populated countries in the world. Although we thoroughly enjoyed our stay in UB, it was now time to leave the modern comforts behind and head to the wilderness. It only took us a couple of hours drive to get to Hustai National Park from UB, not long at all by Mongolian standards. Our base for this first adventure would be a gear camp not far from the park entrance. In 1993, the only remaining true wild horse, the Taki, was reintroduced to the area and has been protected since. Legend has it that the sand of Mutsuk Ills has healing powers, great for aches and pains in your back, in your kidneys, and general body healing and awareness. So let's see if this sand can uh, heal my aches and pains for the adventures to come. After relaxing for a bit, we would venture deeper into the heart of the park in hopes of spotting the highly endangered Taki horse. The park covers an impressive 500 square kilometers of stunning wild nature. And in 2002, UNESCO certified the park as a member of the World Biosphere Network of Natural Reserves. Scattered around the park are ancient burial grounds with deer stones dating back thousands of years a humbling reminder of a very different time. We were warmly welcomed by a local family of herders and invited into their warm and comfortable gear, a welcome break from the bumpy and dusty roads. Along with a few different dairy snacks, we were generously offered a large glass of fermented mare's milk, a popular beverage about the same alcohol content as a light beer. It is certainly an acquired taste, which was quickly washed down with a shot of local vodka.
It's not so strong. Nomads often stick somewhat close to each other, while always leaving enough room for their herds to graze effectively. Even in the remoteness of the steppe, it is still nice and safe having neighbors and family close by. We had arrived at the busiest of times. All members of the family were hard at work, as one of their daughters was about to get married. This meant having to milk their horses every two hours from sunrise to sunset, ensuring that the local delicacies made from the horse milk would be plentiful. Even with more than 200 guests arriving the upcoming weekend, they somehow still found time to show us their way of life. I just hiked the top of a ledge here in Hustai National Park, and I finally got my first glimpse of the Taki wild horses. This park is really famous for the wild horses, and it's one of only three places in the world you can see these wild Taki horses, so it's pretty special. I wanted to photograph them for so long, so I'm really, feel very lucky to be here today. The next part of our adventure would take us into the northernmost part of the country, right on the border of Russia and the Great Siberian Forest. The Tatan tribe has been living in this remote area for thousands of years, and still to this day have managed to keep their traditions alive. We were looking forward to the long drive across the steppe, followed by several days on horseback. We just landed in Maroon, which is a little bit north of Ulaanbaatar, about an hour flight, and I'm getting ready to go on my Sutan adventure, which is about 10 days round trip to see the reindeer herders, which some are, the, are some of the last reindeer herders in the world, so I'm pretty excited to get started. It would be a strenuous haul through some of the most rugged terrain in Mongolia. We would spend a few days living alongside the Tatan and get a better understanding of their life and daily activities. I just woke up from my day two to see the reindeer herders and we drove about four hours in the middle of nowhere towards the reindeer herders and then found a local family and our guide just 
knocked on the gear's door and we slept in the gear with the family last night. So it was really special. They offered us tea and biscuits and we slept on the floor. Pretty incredible. The hospitality in this country is just unreal. And it's said that the nomads can travel for days and if they see a gear, <clears throat> they can stop and stay because the people that are inviting him to the, in them into their home might be in the same situation with no place to stay. So the hospitality is out of this world over here. It's pretty incredible. After 10 excruciating hours, we finally reached the town of Rinchin Lombe, which is on the border of Siberia. It's the last outpost before you reach Russia. The road was excruciatingly painful, really bumpy, up and down mountains, over valleys, through rivers, but it was absolutely stunning and beautiful. I don't want to talk too much about the weather because I hear the weather is particularly rainy and nasty around here but the weather today was absolutely stunning and it was a beautiful drive. It's September here in Mongolia so a lot of the trees are turning yellow which is absolutely a surprise and lucky to be here at this time. I'm really excited to get into my gear camp and relax the rest of the night because tomorrow we've got a long day as well riding horses for about five, six, maybe more hours to get to the Sultan. But this is my gear camp for the night so come check it out pretty nice. We've got a fire when it gets really cold and beds all laid out. This is your traditional gear camp that is made for tourists, but it's the same sort of idea just without all the personal stuff from a nomadic family. another really really long exhausting day but we finally made it to our camp which we're camping tonight in this beautiful valley rivers around us a few little houses and yurts but not much around we rode for about six hours today pretty sure I'm gonna get a divorce after this horse trip but we survived the first day and tomorrow we ride another full day and then we arrive at the Satan the day after, but it's really beautiful. We cross some rivers, just open plains, clouds in the sky, mountains in the distance. And again, we had spectacular weather, so I'm feeling pretty fortunate and pretty stinking sore. So uh, tomorrow should be interesting, but survived the first day and really happy to be at camp at the moment.
So this is day five of our Satan adventure. And this is the day we've been waiting for because today we get to meet the Satan tribe. They are on a border with Russia and Mongolia in a no-go zone. So we need special permits to get into this area and notify the border police and go through a lot of paperwork, but we, all our paperwork's in order. We stayed in a, this beautiful valley behind me last night. And today is finally the day we get to meet the Satan. So it's pretty exciting. We're gonna be staying there for two nights in hopefully teepees. Never stayed in a teepee before, so that should be interesting. Hopefully not too cold. The Tatan is one of the few tribes in the world who rely completely on their reindeer for their daily survival. The reindeer are used as pack animals and for transport. They are milk to create butter, curd and other dairy products. They are antlers for tools such as knives and they are pelts for clothing. We finally arrived at the Sotan camp and we were invited into the chief and his wife's house and she made us some doughy things that are quite delicious and of course reindeer milk tea which is always my favorite but it's okay <laughs> so they keep the babies around and this is probably a yearling or something along those lines so that the females come back at night and therefore the males, males follow the females and they all stick around. So if they tie up the babies, everybody else will come. I am here sitting with the chief of all of the Satan in northern Mongolia, and I've been warmly welcomed into their house, his and his wife's house, and I'm sitting down for a little interview to ask some questions to get a little more educated on the way they live and their lifestyle. So my first question would be, how long have you been chief? And how many Satan are there in this area? So you're a very busy man. What does your job as chief entitle? <laughs> And 
do you feel like the traditions are thriving or is he concerned about some of the cultures dying out and changing as the years go on? One of my questions being how tourism has affected the Satan and both negative and positive. How has the community changed since tourism in the last 10 years has come about? Um, well, I just want to thank you so much for having us here and inviting us into your home, and we feel so honored to be here and see the way you live, and it's such a beautiful culture, and I really feel touched to be here, so thank you very much. <laughs> After meeting with the chief and having productive talks with one of the original founders of the Satan Community and Visitors Center, it was decided to implement a visitor's conservation fee, which in time hopefully will help preserve their amazing culture. As tourists, we have a huge responsibility and must be extremely careful not to exploit tribal communities like the Tatan. We must always show our utmost respect for their ways. Within just a few hours after leaving Ulaanbaatar, we had arrived in the heart of the Bayan Olgi province. The capital of Olgi is the gateway to the majestic Altai mountain range and the nearest access point to experience the legendary Golden Eagle Festival. We're heading to the Eagle Hunter Festival. We're on our way this morning and I've been waiting for this for years and years and years, so I'm thrilled to be going there. Not really sure what to expect. I know there's definitely a bunch of tourists in town, um, but it should be really cool. There's probably around 60 eagle hunters said to be in this festival over a two-day period this weekend, so it should be really fun. We're here a little bit early to kind of catch some of the eagle hunters as they come to the festival. There's about six riding our way, and the landscape is absolutely fantastic. Lighting's great. So hopefully we get a chance to get some shots before too much of the crowds come in. The annual Eagle Festival is held during the first weekend of October, just prior to the main hunting season. More and more competitors join in the festivities each year. And during our visit in 2016, almost 100 eagle hunters attended. Many of the hunters will travel far distances and even across borders to take part. The Kazakh eagle hunters compete in various events to show off their training and hunting skills with their magnificent birds of prey. I just got to the Eagle Festival and it's totally insane and perfect. There's vendors everywhere selling all sorts of Kazakh arts and crafts. We've There's got a fenced-in area over here where you can see the eagles in competition. There's going to be horse racing, camel racing, all sorts of fun stuff over a two-day weekend. So it should be a ton of fun and lots of photo ops.
As visitors, we were spoiled by the variety of skill-based events, such as the best eagle at hunting prey and the best eagle at locating its owner. Along with spectator popular events like best traditional dress, camel racing, and of course, the infamous goatskin tug of war. A grueling tough sport, which occasionally will end with a kiss to the ground, to the great joy of the audience, immediately followed by loud cheers. The Eagle Festival has certainly not gone unnoticed and has quickly become one of the major tourist attractions for travelers wanting to experience the wonders of Mongolia. The week around the festival is bustling with activity and we are getting ready to leave the crowds behind and explore the everyday life of the locals. We had arranged to go live with an eagle hunter and his family for a few days before heading back to UB. Our host for the next few days would be Bashankan, a highly revered eagle hunter who lives with his family on a farm deep in the Altai mountain range. It would turn out to be a stunning drive through beautiful rough landscapes in the glistening mountain sun. Bashankan's oldest son had just returned from a successful hunting trip in the area as we arrived at the compound. The young eagle he brought with him had just finished training and this was its first actual kill, a tasty rabbit. Clearly a very proud moment for a father passing on his skills to the next generation. A practice which has taken place for thousands of years will continue to live on. The eagle was rewarded with the juicy rabbit meat as part of its training teaching it the benefits of man and beast working closely together. I'm about to run with a fake sheepskin and the eagle's gonna catch it while I run. Hopefully not fall on my butt. Okay. <laughs> the relationship between hunters and eagles is truly remarkable. The hunter will steal the eagle from the nest at a very young age and train it until it's ready to join the hunt. Then once the eagle reaches breeding age, it will be released back into the wild so it can reproduce and maintain the eagle population. This great respect for their animal companions is astounding and something which should serve as an inspiration across the world. During our stay, we joined Bashankan in the mountains scouting for prey. And although we did not have much luck bringing home the prize, the experience will stay with us forever. The visit with the eagle hunters of Mongolia is a journey back in time and we are elated seeing the tradition still thriving and feel confident that the culture will hold its ground against the attractions and the lure of the modern world. Epic way to end our Mongolian adventures. It's finally snowing. I'm so excited. I've wanted snow this entire trip. We've got a sunset in the back that is absolutely breathtaking. The mountains have all the snow on them and the sun is coming out and the clouds are parting and it's really spectacular. This trip has been absolutely amazing from visiting the Satan in the north to urban UB to finally up here with the Eagle Hunters and the Eagle Festival. Thanks so much for joining us on this episode and hope to see you next time Adventure Calls. <laughs>